The altimeter is an important tool that can keep you safe while you're flying in the weather, but it also has to be set correctly. So in this video, let's talk about how to do that and I also want to talk about altimeter errors because those can be extremely dangerous if you don't know how those affect your altimeter. Welcome to Free Pilot Training, I'm Josh. As you probably already know, indicated altitude is what you read on the altimeter. And when you dial in a specific air pressure into the Colesman window of the altimeter, the altimeter gives you the height above that pressure setting. But what should we do if we don't know the altimeter setting? At smaller airports, it's not uncommon for the airport to not have an AWOS or an ASOS. And if it does, these things break down all the time, so you may not always know it. But as an instrument pilot, it's very important for you to use the right altimeter setting before takeoff. Because if you dial in the air pressure from your iPhone weather app, your altimeter could be off hundreds of feet, and you don't want that. Now, as most of you already know, if you can't get the local altimeter setting from the METAR or another source like the ATIS, the right thing to do is to dial in the true altitude of your takeoff airport into the altimeter. And as a VFR pilot, you probably found yourself using the field elevation from the chart supplement or the VFR sectional. But if you're going to be flying on instruments, this may not always be the most accurate setting because the field elevation is the highest point on the airport's usable runways. If you set the field elevation at the ramp, this could cause you to be off your altitude a little bit. And we want accuracy to keep us safe. So to get the most accurate setting, here's what I like to do. When you're taxiing to the runway, you should have the airport diagram up on your kneeboard. Or if you use ForeFlight, you can have it pulled up on there as well. Whatever the case, the airport diagram needs to be readily accessible, especially at big airports so you don't accidentally have a runway incursion. The FAA is very concerned about runway incursions, and you should be too. Runway incursions are one of the leading causes of aircraft collisions, so to help avoid that, you should always have the airport diagram readily accessible. When you first start up the aircraft, go ahead and throw in the field elevation if there's no local altimeter setting available. Then, after you taxi up to your takeoff runway and you've completed the run-up, look down at your airport diagram to see if they have a published elevation for the runway that you're taking off from. If they do, this is what you should dial into your altimeter while you're holding short instead of the standard field elevation. This is what we call the touchdown zone elevation. I know what you're thinking, but no, this has nothing to do with football. The touchdown zone elevation is simply the highest point within the first 3,000 foot of a runway. And this measurement typically begins at the threshold, or what I like to call the piano keys. Now, another place you can find this is on an instrument approach plate. We'll be discussing these more in a future video, but when you start working on instrument stuff, you might have one of these in front of you in addition to the airport diagram. And these have a mini airport diagram down in the corner of the plate. And if you look down here, you can get the field elevation and then you can also get the touchdown zone elevation for the specific runway that you're going to be using as well. As you can see, this plate is for runway 18 and the field elevation is 266 feet and the touchdown zone elevation is 259 feet. That's not a huge difference here in Little Rock, but there are some airfields where these differences can be pretty significant. Now, why in the world would we care about this? ATC is not going to vector you within 10 feet of an obstacle. Here in the U.S., they actually have what we call minimum vectoring altitudes, so they don't accidentally run you into something and kill you if your altimeter is off a tiny little bit. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of peace of mind, but now you're probably wondering why it's so important to use a current local altimeter setting if this is the case. Well, by setting the altimeter correctly, this allows air traffic control to give you the best traffic separation possible between other aircraft. Now normally, if you're operating under instrument flight rules, ATC will try to keep your aircraft three miles or more away from other IFR aircraft. But in some types of airspace, they only have to provide 500 feet of vertical separation between you and someone else if they're operating under visual flight rules. And if this is the case, you can see how important it can be to set your altimeter correctly and to make sure you're getting regular updates from ATC especially when you're operating near Class Charlie and Class Bravo airfields that use a Tracon facility. Now, anytime you're operating below 18,000 feet MSL, you should expect to get regular updates to your altimeter from ATC. But remember, if you fly above 18,000, you'll be in Class Alpha airspace. In this airspace, we typically operate at a flight level, which means we need to set our altimeter to 2992. Let's say Chicago Center told me this. Citation 2749 at Foxtrot, climb and maintain flight level 210. 
Climb and maintain flight level 210, citation 2749 or Foxtrot. During the climb, you'd want to keep the current altimeter setting. And then, once you reach 18,000 feet, then you would switch to 299 or 2. In fact, some airplanes will alert you when you're passing 18,000 feet for this very reason. But you might not fly one of these airplanes for a while, so you'll just have to remember this at first. Keep in mind, this applies whether you're flying on IFR Airways or not. So if you're flying direct to your destination, this is still going to apply to you. Then, when you descend below 18,000 feet, ATC will use your call sign and tell you which altimeter setting to use once you clear the class alpha. And this will give you the most accurate altitude to avoid terrain and obstacles. And it'll also give you separation from other airplanes if they need to vector you near other aircraft. Now, you might be wondering how to make sure your altimeter is accurate. According to FAR 91411, the altimeter is required to be inspected by an approved mechanic every 24 calendar months. But let me ask you a question. How comfortable are you flying an airplane where the altimeter hasn't been looked at in two years? Now don't you be paying him no never mind. I done tightened all them thingamadoodles in your altimeter with my trusty torque wrench. Don't trust that guy. A good instrument pilot needs to make sure the altimeter is accurate before every flight. And it's not hard to do this. The main thing you need to remember is that the most accurate place to check the altimeter is on the ground. Now, some airports have information signs like this that can give you something accurate to compare to. If not, you'll want to compare your altimeter to a known field elevation like I talked about a second ago. After you find a known elevation, all you have to do is dial in the local setting and check your indicated altitude against this elevation. The indicated altitude should be within 75 feet of the actual field elevation. If it's not, you should take the aircraft to a maintenance facility to have them check it out and repair the altimeter if necessary. As far as I know, there's no regulation that tells us that we have to do this, but the AIM mentions it as a good practice in 7-2-3. Next, I want to discuss altimeter errors, and contrary to what you might think, the altimeter is not perfect, so you really need to know about these. Up until now, you may have thought that you were really bad at holding your altitude during straight and level flight, but now that you're working on your instrument rating, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's not all you. Our atmosphere is full of areas with different air pressure. I like to call these air pockets, and not only are there pockets of different air pressure, but there are also pockets of different air temperature as well. And these pockets can actually affect your altimeter quite a bit. So it's not just you. Some of it can't be helped. And temperature is one of those things. For example, when air gets warmer, it expands and gets taller. And when air gets cooler, it shrinks back down and gets shorter. This means that if you climb and descend to follow the altimeter because you thought you were a bad pilot, you will actually be moving up and down slightly as you fly through these pockets of warmer and cooler air. In this situation, the aircraft true altitude is changing, or your indicated altitude is actually staying the same. This is why you may have heard me say that the altitude you read on this thing is your indicated altitude. If you had something to perfectly gauge your real true altitude, you'd probably be shocked at how good of a pilot you actually are. But I doubt it. Let's say that you're flying an indicated altitude of 4,000 feet, and you fly through a cold front where the air is cooler. If you continue to fly straight and level and you don't chase the altimeter, your indicated altitude is going to go up. Because of this, you descend back down to get back to your correct indicated altitude, which lowers your true altitude. Now, here's what's cool about this. Remember our memory aids from the last lesson? These actually work for us here as well. From high to low, look out below, and from low to high, you're way too high. If we fly from a warmer area to a cooler area, in other words, a higher temperature to a lower temperature, we need to look out below because we're going to be lower than our altimeter is telling us. Then, if we fly from a cooler area to a warmer area, or an area of lower temperature to an area of higher temperature, we're going to be high because our true altitude, or the altitude where we are, is going to be higher than what we're seeing on the altimeter. Now that you understand how this works, the FAA is going to try to trick you on the test. And instead of asking you what your true altitude is, they may ask you what your indicated altitude is going to be. All them turd nuggets. Yes, indeed. Only a turd nugget would try to throw you off in such a manner. So let me show you this question really quickly. How would your aircraft's indicated altitude change if you flew into an area of cooler weather if you continued to fly straight and level? In this situation, you just need to think for a minute. 
The air cooled down, so the air mass shrunk, which would have brought the aircraft down lower if you had chased the altimeter, but you didn't. You continued to fly straight and level. In this situation, your true altitude stayed the same because you kept flying here, so your indicated altitude actually went up. Remember, from high to low, I need to look out below because I'm lower than I think I am. But how much will these temperatures affect my altitude? I'm so glad you asked that. You and I have a lot in common. Neither one of us like being dead. And they may not ask you about this on the written exam, but I think it's a good idea to talk about. This chart can be found in the AIM in section 7-3-1. Now, the way you read this guy is kind of weird, so let me explain this to you really quick. Let's say I'm going to fly this instrument approach where I'll be intercepting the final approach fix at 2,400 feet MSL. Unfortunately, this chart is based on absolute altitude, so unfortunately we have to do a little math here. If my field elevation is 500 feet, then I should be at 1,900 feet AGL. Now that we know that, we can pull our chart back out and see what the altimeter error is. Now, you could interpolate between the 1500 foot and the 2000 foot column here, but let's just use the 2000 foot tab here and see what we come up with. Now, let's say our temperature is negative 10 degrees Celsius outside. As you can see, we could be as much as 200 feet low, and I don't have to tell you how dangerous this can be. Keep in mind, the lower you get, the more accurate your altimeter gets, and a lot of altitudes that are created for IFR pilots are created with this in mind. But you should always keep this in the back of your mind in case you ever need it, because if you ever see a snowflake on an approach plate, you will need it. Now, one other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that because temperature affects the thickness of the air, it also affects your airspeed indicator. Anytime your true altitude changes because of these temperature changes, your airspeed indicator is also going to change because indicated airspeed gives you a pressure corrected airspeed. If you want more information about this, I've got a whole video on this topic that I think you'll find kind of interesting. It's called Your Airspeed Indicator is Wrong on Purpose. That video isn't actually part of this ground course, but if you haven't already seen that video, you should definitely take a few minutes to watch it. It'll really help you understand this concept a lot better if you're a little bit fuzzy in that area. Hey, I want to thank you for joining me today on this IFR ground lesson. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to smash that like button for me. In the next lesson, we're going to be talking about turning the airplane in IFR flight. And when that video is done, I'm going to throw it right there for you. Thanks for watching. See ya!